And I'm joined this afternoon on this panel with Drs. Harry Reeder, Burke Parsons, and Derek Thomas. And we're here this afternoon to discuss the topic of preaching. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul says to the elders at Ephesus that when he was ministering among them, he did not shrink back from preaching or declaring the whole counsel of God. And so as we begin, let's begin with that question. What does it mean to preach the whole counsel of God? Well, let me, let me pitch in and then I'll lob it over to, to Harry. Um, I mean, in Acts 20, it couldn't possibly have meant that he had preached through the entire Old Testament. Um, so so it's, not, it's not a reference to what we call Lectio Continua preaching, preaching through all the books of the Bible. I, I think in that context, it has a reference to doctrine, that, that he preached uh, all of the doctrines, the relevant, important doctrines that elders, in particular in the F Ephesus church, needed uh, to know and hear. It's interesting that in in, in all three of us here are Presbyterians, and one of the documents that the Westminster Assembly produced in the 1640s was the Directory for the Public Worship of God, which is not exactly what you might think it is if you have never seen it. It, it does say something about worship, but it begins with, with four pages, at least in the version that I have, it's four pages in very small type uh, on preaching. And it's one of the best summaries of what preaching is that, that I know of. But one of the things that it says is that preaching involves finding the doctrine that is in the text. And I think, I think I'm just getting old, but but a lot of preaching today doesn't do that. A lot of preaching today sounds like a commentary. I've, I've listened to sermons and I, and I think, you know, I think I know which commentary that comes from. Um, instead of looking for the doctrine that's over and above the text, um, how this text relates to the whole of the Scriptures. And, and I, think, I think preaching the whole counsel of God means preaching all of God's truth. At least I think that's what it means in Acts 20. Yeah, and I think it's also a takeoff uh, from the Great Commission, which says discipling is to uh, purposefully communicate all that Jesus has given to us teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So if I could just kind of tie in with what Derek has said, um, I think preaching the whole counsel of God, on the one hand, of course, is a desire in expositional preaching to unfold the scriptures. The scriptures unfold the covenant of grace through the preeminence of Christ as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. So uh, that's what we call biblical theology. Uh, and so you're doing justice to that. But on the other hand, there is systematic theology in which the scriptures fit together, uh, slot to whole uh, as they work their way together. And therefore, you are proclaiming um, the theology of God's word in the various theological areas of emphasis which th thirdly means that, and I want to be very careful here, um, everything in the Bible is important. As I said in the sermon, it takes a whole Bible to make the whole Christian. So everything is important, but not everything is as important as other things. That's why he says, I delivered to you in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you that which is of <clears throat> first importance. Well, if something's of first importance, it stands to reason there's something of second importance. That doesn't mean it's not important, 
But dare I say, it does mean you can get that one wrong and still be saved. Uh, Church government, I mean, you don't have to be a Presbyterian to be saved. Now, if I were y'all, I wouldn't take a chance on that, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but you can get that wrong and, um, and still be saved. So when I'm preaching, I'm going to preach with that kind of proportionality and that kind of understanding of the essentials and then building on what's important, but it's not essential for salvation. And so I think that's what they did when they did the Apostles' Creed. They're giving that kind of communication. So, so <clears throat> I, first of all, subscribe exactly to what uh, Dr. Thomas said. And um, in terms of systematic theology, handling the doctrines of God's word, all scripture is profitable for doctrine. And so we want to take the text and present the doctrine embedded in the text, which then leads us to biblical theology or vice versa, where we see the progressive unfolding of the covenant of grace through the preeminence of Christ. And then, of course, realizing that we're preaching the whole counsel of God with proportionality and putting first things first as we build in discipleship. That's well said, sir. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions, and Derek, you're getting uh, to some of this, a lot of misconceptions about what it means or doesn't mean to preach the whole counsel of God. Um, I typically preach Lectio Continua through books of the Bible. Um, But that is, again, not what it means to preach the whole counsel of God. And my fear is always that, though that is typically my habit, though I have preached various series at times, um, that we don't want to make a case that that is the only way we can preach. Um, I was just dealing with this, in fact, a couple of weeks ago down in Santiago, Chile, uh, because there was a misconception that expositional or expository preaching means that you are necessarily preaching through entire books of the Bible. And that's not what expositional or expository preaching means. It's not what preaching the whole counsel of God means. Uh, Many preachers throughout history, many fine, faithful preachers today do not preach through entire books of the Bible, but they are still preaching expositionally or expositorily. They are preaching from the text. I think it's also very important that we keep in mind that when we talk about preaching the whole counsel of God, um, that we understand that it means a preacher shouldn't deliberately avoid certain passages or difficult passages, uh, difficult doctrines that pertain to the passage from which he's preaching because he doesn't want to have to deal with it or he doesn't want to have to explain it, or he doesn't want to have to take the time to uh, unpack it. And I think that is a bigger problem in many of the evangelical churches today, where pastors will look at a particular passage, and they will preach the text, as you were saying, Derek, but they will avoid dealing with the very apparent doctrines that the passage is dealing with. And so I think even though they might be preaching expositionally in one sense, They're not really preaching the whole counsel of God because they're deliberately avoiding certain doctrines that are there in the text. Chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession states that the whole counsel of God concerning man's salvation, God's glory, and so forth is, is either expressly set out in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. What does that phrase, by good and necessary consequence, mean, and how is that important for interpretation and for preaching? I, I, guess, uh, I guess infant baptism uh, would fall here, that there isn't a specific text in the New Testament that says that babies should be baptized, but we draw... Uh, and, and the inference has to be both good and necessary. Uh, we draw an inference, at least the three of us draw an infer- inference, that there is a continuity of practice uh, in the administration of the sacrament from the Old Covenant into the New Covenant, and therefore inclusive of, of babies, covenant children. 
and therefore that the sign and seal of the covenant should be applied as a principle of continuity. So we read Peter on the day of Pentecost saying, the promise is to you and to your children. And he's speaking to thousands of Jews, Jewish Christians, but they're still Jews in the, in the default of their thinking. And the good and necessary consequence that we draw is that Peter, if ever there was a, an occasion in which to teach newly converted Jews that there was no longer a practice of conferring the sign and seal of the covenant upon children, this was the moment to do it. And the fact that Peter didn't do it and used language specifically mentioning children, we would draw what is both a good and a necessary um, consequence that there's a principle of continuity in the New Testament. That's just one example. Uh, so I think um, uh, I think this also relates to almost every doctrine. Um, well, I'm, I'll go ahead and say every doctrine in which the mind of man is called to wrap itself around who God is and what God does. Um, we we may, we we study the scriptures, and for instance, we just heard this wonderful sermon on Trinity. Well, you don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. That's, what, that's a term that we've developed in order to accommodate the unfolding of the doctrine of God, one God in three persons. And that's why, as our speaker so aptly pointed out, if anybody tells you they've got an illustration of the doctrine of the Trinity, don't listen, because you cannot illustrate the doctrine of the Trinity, whether it's eggs or shamrocks or, or whatever. It's impossible. What you have is you have a propositional truth that the Scripture unfolds for us. You make the propositional truth. You give it a title, whether it's um, um, uh, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, or we uh, deal with federalism or et cetera, et cetera. You give it the title. Then you have to come back and say, it doesn't mean this and it doesn't mean this. We call it knowledge by negation. Whenever you have to use knowledge by negation, you know that good and necessary inference has gone on in which the scripture is being honored as being non-contradictory, even though there are things that don't our mind can't wrap around, thus we have to declare it and then say what it's not on this side and what it's not on this side. And I think that's, um, uh, that's one of the ways that we see good and necessary inference at work. And uh, usually it shows up when you're speaking of who God is and what God does because Romans 11 is true. Um, who becomes the counselor of God? God, you're too much. I cannot, um, I can know you intimately, I can know you accurately, but I cannot know you exhaustively. And, uh, and I, that's why, made in the image of God, we then take hold of the scriptures as God reveals himself, knowing that scripture does not contradict, uh, sc uh, scripture does not contradict itself. In fact, that adds to my previous answer, one of the reasons you need the whole counsel of God is because the ultimate interpreter of Scripture is Scripture itself, and um, and knowing how to do that, and uh, when you've got a difficult text, you go to the easier text because the Scripture can't contradict itself. Thus, we see the uh, we see the coherence of doctrine, um, and I think that's what the Westminster divines were pointing us to. Are you all in the mood for a little story? So in 1996, thanks for laughing, David. In 1996, I attended my first Ligonier Ministries National Conference, and it was right here at the Orange County Convention Center. Were some of you here at that conference? I'm sure there are many okay. It was my first one, and uh, you recall perhaps it was one of RC's main sessions where he he told me if I didn't believe in the sovereignty of God and that God is sovereign over salvation, that I needed to repent. I thought, who is this guy? Well, after the conference, I was making my way through the bookstore, and I was a poor college student. I didn't have much money, and uh, I found the only book I could afford. <laughs> 
and it was a little white paperback book. And it said on it, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, I had no idea what that was. I'd never heard of it. It was just a cheap book and uh, had a nice picture on it. And so I bought the book. I brought it home and went on the shelf, and I began to read it. And I found that it was one of the most important and significant books that had ever been written. And the Directory of Public Worship that Derek mentioned a few minutes ago is very helpful for all of us to read. If you've not read it, take your time. It's one of the most helpful parts of the Westminster Standards. But when I came to chapter one of the Confession, and I read this language about how we interpret Scripture, because that's really at the heart of Aaron's question. How do we interpret Scripture? And, and as you know, that's the science of hermeneutics. And I read in the confession that we interpret Scripture not simply by understanding that which is explicitly or expressly written down in Scripture, but also that which by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. I read that and read that and read that over and over and over again because that, dear friends, is the foundation for your really understanding of the Bible. It is the foundation for our understanding theology. It's our foundation for understanding God. If you ignore that clause, that phrase, your interpretation of Scripture will run afoul. It is one of the biggest problems that I deal with as a pastor, people not understanding how we interpret Scripture, people not understanding this clause. Aaron, we deal with this all the time in Table Talk. It's something that we ask authors to write on because it is something that so many evangelicals simply do not understand. And if you, this is new to you, if you're hearing this language for the first time, then you need to spend some time in hermeneutics. You need to go online to Table Talk and look up some good articles on it. There's a book by Ryan McGraw. Didn't he write on this? Ryan McGraw wrote a book on this on good and necessary consequence because, dear friends, it is one of the most, if not the most, foundational principles for how we interpret Scripture and how we do theology from Scripture. We all hear sermons all the time, weekly, if not more. What do we mean when we say that preaching is a means of grace? I kind of like the way we're doing this. Well, if Sinclair were here, he would quibble with the term means of grace. Um, I I think because... um, we can use the phrase to imply a, a somewhat mechanical idea of how grace operates. The, what we mean by means of grace is, and, and especially the term ordinary means of grace, uh, is uh, church, reading the Bible, listening to sermons, praying. Uh, fellowshipping with one another. This, this, this is how um, God intends for us uh, to uh, receive salvation and understand salvation, uh, and, and not through extraordinary um, ministries of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's that's over and above uh, the the ordinary means of of, of grace. Yeah, so let me try to give it pastorally in terms of il- illustration. So Christ is ascended. We're fixed on Jesus by the power of the Spirit of God through the Word of God. In other words, Jesus, dare I call him the reservoir of grace by which we are saved, has two conduits that he has ordained connecting to us. This is the way I picture it if y'all will bear with me, um, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And as our brother said, boy, what a great uh, talk that was that um, 
uh, both Steve and Michael gave about this, is that uh, they work together. Uh, you can't be convicted without the Word of God. You can't be convicted without the Spirit of God. Um, Jesus said, uh, put no confidence <clears throat> in the flesh. It is the Spirit who gives life. My words are spirit and life. So what are the means that God has ordained for the Word and the Spirit to be at work in our lives? Well, historically, I think rightly, we have said the primacy of preaching Notice not the exclusivity of preaching, but the primacy of preaching. I agree with Spurgeon. Uh, uh, the pulpit is the thermopylae of Christianity. The rest of the means of grace are downstream from preaching and prayer. The ministry of prayer and the word are absolutely essential. Then the display of God's word and the sacrament takes on meaning as we participate by faith. But remember, faith comes from hearing the Word. So prayer and the Word, then the sacraments, then the horizontal means of grace and fellowship and the communion of the saints uh, begin to take on dimensions. You see this in Acts chapter 2 as it describes the early church. The early church was conceived in a prayer meeting, Acts chapter 1, birthed in a sermon, Acts chapter 2, and matured with these four statements. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the word proclaimed, uh, the fellowship, the word shared, the breaking of the bread, the sacrament, the word displayed, and the prayers, which is the word returned. And that's kind of the way I look at the means of grace, how Christ gathers, nourishes, sins and seals his people with his word and his spirit. And, um, and, so I and then finally, I'll just say, in terms of preaching, this is not job, I'm not saying this for job security. Uh, I believe that, um, I believe the second most important decision any believer makes after God calls them to himself and by faith and repentance they come to Christ the next most important decision is what kind of preaching you listen to, how you listen to it, and what you do with what you've listened, bathed in prayer. That's well said, sir. Um, preaching is a means of, of grace, and, and hearing that and understanding that, it's, of course, important that we understand that as Christians, God saves us by grace, and God sanctifies us by grace. Um, God saves us and keeps us by grace. It's like what we sing in the great hymn, Amazing Grace. Grace taught my heart to fear, and grace will lead me home. And so, attending to the means of grace, and even the Directory of Public Worship addresses this, how we attend to the means of grace. And this, that it might surprise you, uh, some of the things that it commends. Uh, we are to be paying attention. Uh, we are to be listening. We are not to be distracted. We are to be focused on what is being said when our pastor is preaching. There is something special that God the Holy Spirit does through the shepherd and shepherds that God has appointed to serve us and their servants. Our authority is not ultimate. Our authority is ministerial. Our authority is declarative to declare to God's people His Word. And in doing so, God is, as Dr. Reeder said, nourishing us. As we sit under the ministry of the Word, that is language that we would do very well to bring back into our vocabularies. As we sit under the ministry of the Word, we are growing, being challenged, being convicted, not by just general, general words of conviction, but particular words of conviction that are particular to those congregations to which those pastors are preaching. And as they preach, and as we preach, and as we are convicted, as we are comforted, as we are encouraged, as we are edified, we grow as disciples, we are nourished as God's children, and God shows us and reveals to us and reminds us of, I don't know about you, but that's one of the things that I most desperately need every week. I need to be reminded of God's grace, not just as sort of, a, sort of a floating entity in the air, but that God is a gracious God, 
that he is gracious and that he gives more grace. And when we draw near to him, he draws near to us and he gives us that grace and we need that grace. We need to be reminded of that grace. We need to be nourished with that grace. And what it does is it, it gets our eyes off of everything else in the world, all the distractions that we're dealing with every day of our lives, all the busyness, the noise, the crowds, the messiness of life, the confusion of life, the anxiety, both socio-politically, globally, politically, the anxiety of our hearts, and it focuses our eyes on Christ. It focuses our eyes on the grace of God in Christ, and the Spirit reminds us that we are His children. God doesn't do it for His sake. He does it for our sake. And so that grace that nourishes us, and that's what preaching ought to do. It's not an academic lecture. It's not, it's not just a, a big group Bible study. It is a time where God's people come together to be nourished, come together to worship, come together to be discipled, come together to be convicted. And so all of that is taking place in preaching all by the power of the Spirit. Please join me in thanking these dear men.